The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On you, Husky! <laughs> Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. It was late one winter afternoon. Sergeant Preston was strolling along Front Street in Dawson City with the great dog Yukon King at his side. A man was standing on the boardwalk looking around uncertainly. He was a young man with a swarthy complexion and a black mustache. But what made him particularly noticeable was his towering height. Though more slenderly built than the Mountie, he was several inches taller than Sergeant Preston. As the sergeant approached, the stranger stopped him. Pardon me, Marty. I, I wonder if you can give me some information. Well, Troy, what is it you want to know? Is there any place in town where I can hire a dog team? Why, yes. Try Frenchy Duquesne's kennels. Follow the next street to the outskirts of town. You can't miss it. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Come along, Jim. Oh, oh, oh. The tall stranger followed the sergeant's directions and soon arrived at Duquesne's kennels. Frenchy was busy attending to one of his huskies in a wire-enclosed run outside his cabin. Pardon me. Oh, oh bonjour, monsieur. You're Frenchy Duquesne? Oui. My name's Lee Gonzalez. Very happy to meet you. What can I do for you? I, uh, understand you ran out dog teams. Oui, that is so. You wish for a hire team? Yes, I'd like to hire an outfit for, uh, oh, uh, a couple of days. I'm not sure exactly how long the trip will take. Eh bien. You know how to handle team? Take care of dogs? No, sure, sure. That is, I haven't done any dog driving myself, but I came up to Dawson with a freight outfit. I've seen how the drivers handle their huskies, and I'm sure I'll make out all right. My huskies, they are fine, well-trained dogs. Just treat them right. You will find them very easy to handle. Good. Uh, how much do you charge for renting a team? Fifty dollars well, a day. Fifty dollars? Oui, that is reasonable price. Oh, well, all right, I... I want to leave tomorrow morning. Can you have a team hitched up for me at, uh, say, 8 o'clock? Sure thing, my friend. You'll be here tomorrow at 8, and Frenchy DeCane will have one fine team of huskies all harnessed up, ready to mush. After leaving Duquesne's kennels, the young man returned to the center of town and went to the Victoria Hotel. He went up to his room where his wife was waiting for him. Hello, darling. Hello. Were you able to hire a team? Yes. Uh, Monty directed me to a place on the outskirts of town. The owner charges $50 a day, so it'll cost us at least $100. $100? Goodness, that's rather expensive, isn't it? Yeah, it is for us, dear. Especially considering that we've sunk every penny we've got into this venture. I even had to borrow money from Clyde Tappan to finance our trip up here to the Yukon. Yes, I know. If we don't find those rubies, we'll sure be in a hole. We'll find them, darling. I'm sure we will. I don't know. The odds are against us. Think how many years it's been. That doesn't matter, Lee. I can't explain it, but I... Well, I just have a feeling that the rubies will still be there. <laughs> a woman's intuition, huh? Call it that if you like, but... I really mean it. Well, let's hope you're right, dear. By tomorrow evening, we ought to know for sure. The following morning, two men entered the Monte Carlo Cafe and sat down at a corner table. One was a youngish, sharp-featured man with crafty-looking, light-colored eyes. His companion, who was somewhat older, was a burly fellow with heavy sideburns and a flashy diamond ring on one finger. After they had ordered and paid for their drinks, the older man spoke. Well, Tabin, here we are in Dawson City, but we still haven't caught up to Gonzalez. So, what's the next move? Hang it out, Brody. I wish I knew. We trailed Gonzalez all the way up here from Skagway. Yeah, but he kept one jump ahead of us all the way. Now it looks like we've lost him for good. We don't even know for sure that he's in Dawson. Yeah, we know he was heading this way. Sure, but that doesn't prove that Dawson was his final destination. Maybe he was just planning to pass through here on his way farther north. Maybe he turned east up the Klondike for that matter. 
Trying to pick up his trail here is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Wait a minute. I think I have an idea. Well, let's hear it. Instead of us trying to pick up Gonzalez's trail by ourselves, why don't we get some experts to do the job for us? Experts? What are you talking about? I'm referring to the Northwest Mounted Police. Are you crazy? Far from it. Now listen, Brody. Suppose you go to Mountie headquarters and tell him some cock and bull story about being robbed. Say you were held up yesterday evening on your way into town. Go on. When they ask you what the holdup man looked like, you give them Gonzalez's description. You catch on? Yeah, now I savvy. We make the Mounties think he's committed a crime and they'll start hunting for him. That's right. And if those redcoats are half as good as they're cracked up to be, they ought to run him down in short order. Yes, but what happens when they ask me to identify him? Nothing. Gonzalez doesn't know you. Just look him over and say, sorry, this isn't the right man. After which, the Mounties will have to turn him loose. From that point on, we won't let him out of our sight till we get our hands on those rubies. <laughs> Tapping my boy, allow me to congratulate you. That is what I call a mighty smart plan. <laughs> a short time later, the man called Brody came to Mounted Police Headquarters. Sergeant Preston and Constable Ross were seated in the office. Morning. Howdy. I came here to report the robbery. Oh? Huh? When and where did it happen? Well, it happened last night. I was camped on the trail a few miles south of town. A fellow showed up, pulled a gun on me, and swiped every cent I had. What did he look like? But he was a young fellow, real tall. In fact, he was just about the tallest gent I've seen since I hit the territory. He must have been about, oh, six feet six, I reckon. Anything else? Well, he had a mustache. He was dark-complected. He looked as though he might be Spanish or Italian, maybe. I see. How'd he make his getaway? He was driving a team. My own dogs were all unhitched, so I couldn't take out after him. Huh? Besides, I didn't have a gun, and I wasn't hankering to stop a bullet. May I have your name? Brody. Sloan Brody. Sloan Brody. Where do you live? Well, I'm stopping at the Royal Albert Hotel. All right. Do you uh, think you'll be able to catch this fellow who robbed me? Yes. From the description you've given me, we should be able to find him, though it may take a little time. As soon as we have anything to report, we'll get in touch with you. Well, that's good enough. Well, so long and thanks. Bye. Alex. Yes, Sergeant. Take over the office for the time being, will you? You're going out? Yes, I saw a man yesterday who answered the description that Brody just gave me. I'm going to check on him. Come along, King. <laughs> Sergeant Preston left headquarters and went to Frenchie Duquesne's kennels. Sergeant Preston and King, it's good to see you. Hello, Frenchie. <laughs> King, old fella. <laughs> you are one fine dog. If Sergeant ever want for sell you, I pay any price he name. Not today, Frenchie. Came to see you for a different reason. Oh, police business, huh? That's right. Yesterday afternoon, a man asked me where he could hire a dog team, and I directed him here to your kennels. Young fellow, swarthy, dark mustache, very tall. Say no more, Sergeant. I know the man you mean. He's tall like pine tree, that one. Are you ready, my team? We. Oui. He made the arrange yesterday afternoon. Call for team this morning. This morning? Didn't he use the team last night? I know. Did you find out anything about him? I find out his name... It is Lee Gonzalez. Lee Gonzalez. We, oui. He's a stranger in Dawson. He tell me he come up with a freight outfit from Skagway, no doubt. How long ago did he leave? He come to Kennels around 8 o'clock. Leave with team maybe 10, 15 minutes later. In other words, a little over two hours ago. We, oui. You plan to go after him? Yes, I do. Ah. You mean he is wanted for some crime? He is, unless there are two men in the territory who answer to the same description. Well... Thanks for the information. Don't mention it, Sergeant. But I hope he has not stolen my team. Don't worry, Francie. I'll see you get your team back. Come on, King. <laughs> After returning to headquarters, the sergeant harnessed his own team and headed for the trail leading northward out of Dawson. On, King! On, you husky! The husky strained at the traces, and the sled fairly flew over the hard-packed snow. It was shortly after one o'clock in the afternoon when the sergeant finally overhauled his quarry. He found Gonzalez and his attractive young wife seated beside a campfire, just finishing their midday meal. Looking, hello, husband. Hold on. Well, hello there. Say, you're the Mounty I spoke to at Dawson yesterday. That's right. I'm Sergeant Preston. How do you do? I'm uh, Lee Gonzalez, and this is my wife, Elaine. How do you do, Sergeant? How do you do? If you're not the right man, Gonzalez, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I'll have to ask you both to put up your hands. Oh, put up our hands? What is this? Do as I say. All right. 
Going to search you to see if you're carrying a gun. Watch him, King. All right. You may put your hands down. Now, do you mind telling us what this is all about? I'll ask the questions if you don't mind. Where are you from? San Francisco, USA. What's your business in the territory? Personal. Where'd you go yesterday after leaving Duquesne's kennels? Back to the Victoria Hotel. Did you leave town during the evening? No, I was in Dawson all evening and all night. All right. Now I'll explain what this is all about. Last night, a man was held up and robbed on the trail south of town. According to the victim, the robber was a young man with a swarthy complexion and a black mustache and exceptionally tall, what? somewhere around six feet six. But, but that's impossible. Well, it's, it's a coincidence, that's all. Perhaps, and if so, I apologize again. But in order to make sure, I'll have to insist on your returning to Dawson. Dusk was falling, and the oil lamp on Sergeant Preston's desk had already been lighted as Constable Ross and Sloan Brody arrived at Mounted Police Headquarters. The sergeant and Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez were waiting in the office. Well, howdy, Sergeant. The constable says you've rounded up a suspect. That's right. Will you stand up, please, Gonzalez? Come over here toward the light. All right. Well, I'll be hanged. This fellow answers the description right enough, Sergeant, but no, he's not the man. You're quite sure of that? Yeah, positive. Looks a lot like him, but I'm sure he's not the same man. The robber had more of a square jaw, and let me see. He had a mole on the left side of his face. You didn't mention a mole in your description. Oh, didn't I? Well, I reckon I must have forgotten about that. Anyway, I figured his height would be enough to tag him. But it sure looks like I was mistaken. Yes, it certainly does. Well, are you satisfied now, Sergeant? Yes, and I'm terribly sorry for the inconvenience I've caused you. If there's anything I can do... You've done enough already. You brought us ten miles back to town, and you've cost us a day of valuable time. Well, now you can't blame the Sergeant. I can and do blame him. Come on, Elaine, let's get our coats on. All right, Lee. We'll have to check back into the hotel to get a fresh start in the morning. Well, I may as well be going, too. If you get any more leads, Sergeant, be sure and let me know, huh? You'll be stopping at the Royal Albert for some time. Yeah, that's right. Well, so long. Good night. As Brody left Mounted Police Headquarters, he paused for a moment and looked around, as though expecting to see someone. A man was standing in the shadows across the street. Brody walked toward him. It was his partner, Clyde Tatton. Well, how about it, Brody? Was it Gonzalez they nabbed? Yeah, it was Gonzalez right in it. He and his wife are still in the office. Where'd they find him? Somewhere about ten miles from town. I don't know which direction. See, there they are now. They're leaving headquarters. By thunder, it's them all right. Come on, get back here in the shadows more so they won't spot us. Yeah. I heard him tell his wife they'd have to check back into the hotel and get a fresh start in the morning. His wife's on the sled. Yeah. He's getting ready to drive away. Come on, we'll follow them and find out which hotel they go yeah. to. Lee Gonzalez drove his team along the street at an easy pace, and the two crooks were able to keep his sled in sight without difficulty. He drew up before a hotel on Front Street. Victoria Hotel, huh? So that's where they're going to put up. They'll probably be leaving the first thing in the morning. Yeah, we'll come back here early and keep watch on them. When they start out, we'll see which direction they take out of town. Then we'll get our own team, check out of the hotel, and start after them. Sergeant Preston had been puzzled by the evening's events. But it wasn't until the following day that he voiced his suspicions to Constable Ross. Alex, what do you make of Sloan Brody? Offhand, he strikes me as a slippery sort of a customer. He strikes me the same way. Judging from the cut of his clothes and that diamond ring on his finger, I'd say he was a professional gambler. Why? I can't help thinking there was something odd about what happened here last night. Uh -huh. What do you mean? How many men have you ever seen as tall as Lee Gonzalez? <laughs> Mighty few. Exactly. And the odds against there being two men of that height here in the Yukon, both having identical descriptions, uh, seems almost incredible. Say, it does seem odd when you stop to think of it. What are you getting at, Sergeant? Well, maybe I'm wrong, but when Brody gave us that line about the mole on the robber's face, it didn't sound very convincing. Somehow I had the feeling that Gonzalez really was the man he wanted us to find. In that case, why should Brody deny it? Well, that's what I can't understand unless... Unless what? Unless the whole story of the robbery was just a trick to get us to track down Gonzalez. I don't get it. Oh, frankly, neither do I, but if Brody's up to something, I'd like to know what it is. Do you want me to check up on him? Yes, that wouldn't do any harm. Suppose you go over to the Royal Albert Hotel and keep an eye on Brody's movements. See if you can find out what his business is here in Dawson. Right, Sergeant. 
Less than 20 minutes later, the constable returned to headquarters with an excited look on his face. Back so soon, Alex? Yes. Didn't Brody say last night that he'd be stopping at the Royal Albert for some time? That's right. Well, he was lying. He's left town. Oh? He was staying at the hotel with a fellow named Clyde Tappan. According to the desk clerk, they checked out early this morning and drove off on their sled. Without notifying us. Yep. In other words, since we found Gonzales, Brody has suddenly lost all interest in recovering his stolen money. That business about the robbery must have been a fake. Yes, and we know that Gonzales was planning to leave town this morning, too. What are you going to do, Sergeant? Going to take King over to Brody's hotel room and see if he can pick up his scent. Come on, boy. <laughs> Meanwhile, Lee Gonzalez and his wife were traveling along the trail north of Dawson. It was mid-afternoon when Lee glanced behind them and remarked to Elaine in a worried voice. Hang it all, that sled is still following us. But, Lee, just because they're traveling behind us doesn't mean they're following us. That's just your imagination. Imagination, my eye. When we stopped to eat, they dropped out of sight. We hit the trail again, there they were behind us. And the same thing happened when we stopped to rest. If they weren't trailing us, they'd have passed as long as... But why should anyone be trailing us? I don't know. But don't forget, we're on our way to find a ruby necklace that's worth a fortune. Darling, you're just getting nervous and worked up about nothing. Maybe, but just the same, I'm going to make sure. What are you going to do? As soon as we get around that bend up ahead, I'm going to turn off the trail. Get on there! Mush! The trail wound around the foot of a rocky hillside. After rounding the bend, Lee swung his team off the trail and headed up the slope. Gee there! Here you, Husky! About a hundred feet up the slope, he halted the sled behind a group of large boulders. Ho, ho now! Ho now! Now what? Wait here and give them a chance to pass us. These boulders will hide us from here. It was about 20 minutes later that the two travelers who had been following them came around the bend in the trail. Now we'll see what happens. Lee, they're stopping. Yeah. They're puzzled. They're wondering what's happened to us. They'll see our sled tracks leading up the hillside. See, wait a minute. There's something familiar about those two. Lee, you're right. That one man is Clyde Tappan. Holy mackerel. And the other one is that fellow Brody. They've seen us. So much the better. I'm going to get to the bottom of this right now. Are you looking for us, Tappan? Matter of fact, we are. Well, if you have something to say to us, come on up and say it. The two crooks trudged up the slope to the spot where Lee and Elaine were waiting. So you followed us all the way up here from San Francisco, eh, Tappan? That's right. I landed at Skagway two days after you did. Oh, by the way, you've both met Brody, haven't you? Yes, we met last night at Mountie headquarters. (laughs) Well, I'm sorry it had to be under such unpleasant circumstances. eh? Brody was working in a gambling house down in Skagway. He convinced me that he could be a big help to me in my little venture, especially since I was new to the North, eh? Chaco, as they say. And just what is your little venture? I didn't intend to reveal myself just yet. Not until you and Elaine had laid hands on those rubies. But since you've spotted us, it looks like I'll have to lay my cards on the table. Well? We want those rubies, Lee. Oh. And I suppose you expect me to tell you where to find them. Hmm? I not only expect it, I'm going to insist on it. Lee, he has a gun. Get your hands up, both of you. You think that gun's going to scare us into talking? You're crazy. <laughs> I think you'll talk all right with a little persuasion. Go on back to the sled, Brody, and get some of that rope we brought. Right. A few moments later, Brody returned with a rope. Under the threat of Tappan's leveled gun, Lee was forced to submit while Brody tied his hands behind him. Now comes the persuasion. Grab the girl, Brody. Don't you dare come near me. Lay a hand on her and I'll kill you. All right, I've got it. Now then, Gonzalez, are you going to tell us where to find those rubies? Or are we going to have to do a little arm twisting? It was some time later that Sergeant Preston and Constable Ross approached along the trail. Hey, what's the matter with King, Sergeant? Oh, yes, oh, oh. He's going up the hillside. Yes. There were sled tracks leading up there toward those boulders. Come on, Alex, let's have a look. The Mounties started up the slope. A few moments later, they found Lee and Elaine lying bound and gagged in the snow behind the boulders. Sergeant, look. It's Gonzalez and his wife. Help me untie them, Alex. Yes, it wasn't long before the prisoners had been freed. Oh, thanks. Thanks a thousand times. That goes double for me. How did you ever happen to find us? We were afraid that Brody and his friend might be up to something, so we trailed them from town. They were up to something, all right. They're the ones who tied us up. You saw how they had those ropes anchored to that tree root? That was to make sure we didn't roll out from behind these boulders and work our way down to the trail. They figured we'd freeze to death before anyone ever found us. Tell me the whole story. Oh, I, 
I hardly know how to begin. Suppose you begin by telling me why you came to the Yukon. All right, Sergeant. We came to recover a valuable ruby necklace that was left here by my grandfather about 60 years ago. Ruby necklace? That's right. It was like this. My grandfather came from a Spanish family that settled in California a long time ago. In 1839, he sailed to Alaska on a trading schooner. In those days, Alaska was a Russian colony. Yes, I know. Well, the ship put in at Sitka. And there, my grandfather fell in love with the daughter of the Russian governor. In fact, he stayed behind when the ship sailed. She fell in love with him, too, but the governor opposed the match because my grandfather had no money. What happened? Well, they eloped one night and were married by a missionary priest. She had a valuable ruby necklace, and she took it along with her, thinking they could sell it and raise enough money to make a start in life. Where'd they go? They headed north into the interior till they came to the Yukon River. Then they started following the river, hoping to, to reach a Hudson's Bay Company post. Did they make it? No. His wife came down with fever en route. So they took shelter in a cave. Grandfather did everything he could to save her life, but it was no use. She died. Apparently, Grandfather just about well, went out of his head with grief. He cursed the necklace and threw it away somewhere in back of the cave. I see. Well, eventually, he got back to civilization. And later on, he married again. But he never made any effort to recover the necklace. And when he told me the story, I, I was just a boy at the time. He said he never wanted to lay eyes on the necklace again. But I made up my mind that someday I was going to recover it. So now you've come to the Yukon to try to find it. That's right, Sergeant. I was hoping it would give us a start in life. How did Brody come into the picture? Brody is working with Tappan. <laughs> I thought Tappan was a friend of ours. I even borrowed money from him to finance the trip up here. But instead, he followed us, hoping to get the rubies for himself. Where is the cave? Well, from what my grandfather told me, it's located about 20 miles downriver from the mouth of the Klondike. And it's marked by a cairn of stones near the cave entrance where he buried his wife. I've seen that cairn. By golly, so have I, Sergeant. I sure never knew the story connected with it. Is that where Brody and Tappan have gone? That's right. They forced me to talk by threatening to harm Elaine. They took our sled with them. Alex, I want you to take Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez back to town. What about you, Sergeant? I'm going after Brody and Tappan. Dusk was falling when the two crooks finally reached the cave which Lee Gonzalez had described to them. It was located in the face of a hillside overlooking the Yukon River. Oh, there. Oh, oh, oh. This must be the place right here, eh? Yeah, there's the kind of stones Gonzalez told us about. Yeah. Better get a lantern off the sled. We'll need it to search inside the cave. Oh, that's a good idea. After lighting the lantern, the two crooks advanced into the cave. Sure is a big place. It was a way into the hillside, eh? Yeah. Looks like we'll have our work cut out for us. Well, let's get busy and search. Right. The floor of the cave was covered with a rocky debris, and the two men realized they would have no easy job in searching the cave floor. The job was tedious and exhausting. Night closed in outside the cave, and still they hadn't found what they were looking for. Finally, Brody straightened up and exclaimed in disgust. Oh, blessed all my knees are killing me. I'm beginning to think we went to all this trouble for nothing. Maybe you're right. After all, it's been 60 years since... Uh, Brody. Huh? I found it. Uh, holy jumping Jupiter. Here, let me have a look at it. Bring the lantern up close. Yeah, huh? sure. Did you ever see anything like it in your life? By thunder. I'll bet the stones in this necklace are worth 100,000. So you found the rubies. How about it? Listen, I'll get him. No, you don't. As Brody fell, Tappan had swung and smashed the lantern, plunging the cave into darkness. At the same time, he dived for cover behind a big rock. Knowing himself protected, he drew his gun and fired in the general direction of the Mountie. But the sergeant had flung himself face down and the shot missed. As he hit the ground, Preston had given King a slight nudge, trusting the great dog to do what was needed. Now the Mountie lay motionless, scarcely daring to breathe for fear of giving his position away. Again, Tappan fired. And again, the bullet went high. I know where you are, Preston. If I haven't hit you so far, it must be because you're lying flat on the ground. Well, this time I'll aim lower, and I won't miss. <laughs> King had understood his master. He knew what to do. He charged, knocking Tappan off balance. The shot went wild. Attention focused on the sergeant. The crook hadn't been aware of King's approach. Help me, help me call up your dog. Hold him, King. Why still, Tappan, if you don't want to get hurt? All right, all right, I won't move. Striking a match, Sergeant Preston made out the figure of Brody lying unconscious where he had fallen. The Mountie groped his way through the darkness, 
and after striking several more matches, located the guns of both crooks. Then he left King to guard Tappan, went outside the cave to the spot where he had left his sled. A few moments later, he returned with a lantern. All right, King, let him up, boy. On your feet, Tappan. You're under arrest in the name of the Crown. Why, Sunday, if it hadn't been for that Never dog. mind the post-mortems. Just turn around while I snap on these handcuffs. And we'll see about bandaging your partner. Late the following day, Sergeant Preston knocked on the door of Lee's and Elaine's hotel room. Sergeant Preston, come on in. Thanks. Well, you got back, Sergeant. Tell me, did you catch Tappan and Brody? Yes, they're occupying cells at the jail. The reason I came here was to turn this over to you. Lee, it's the rubies. Holy mackerel, just look at them. Why, they're, they're like frozen fire. I'm going to try them on. Oh, Lee, aren't they gorgeous? And to think they're worth a fortune. How can we ever thank you, Sergeant? I'll show you how. Bring them here, honey. What are you going to do? I'm going to pry one of these rubles out of its setting and give it to Sergeant Hold Preston. it, Lee. Don't be foolish. Foolish nothing. It's the least I can do after all you've done for us. Lee's right, Sergeant. We want you to have it. Well, thanks just the same, but I'm not allowed to accept rewards. Oh, listen, Sergeant. Yesterday afternoon, Elaine and I were in the worst danger we've ever been in. We might have frozen to death. You saved our lives, and now you're handing a fortune over to us. A fortune which is rightfully yours as your grandfather's heir. You folks have gone through a lot to find these rubies. Now that you have them, this case is closed. In our next adventure, Sergeant Preston reports to Inspector Conrad at Mounted Police Headquarters. Sergeant Preston reporting, sir. Sergeant, there have been three robberies and a murder in Selkirk all within ten days. There are no clues. Constable Higgins has telegraphed for help. I see. Higgins is a good man, sir. If he's stumped, clever people must be operating down that way. That's right. I want you to go down there at once, Sergeant. I'm counting on you to clear up those cases. Right, sir. I'll leave at once and take King with me. Fine. Goodbye and good luck. Bye, sir. Come along, King. <laughs> the unsolved robberies and murder in Selkirk has the whole town talking. When Sergeant Preston and his great dog, Yukon King, try to solve the mysterious cases... It may be that the Mountie will walk right into a death trap. Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next adventure. This program came from Detroit. Today's most popular heroes of outdoor adventure are heard every weekday afternoon from 5 to 6 o'clock. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Mark Trail roams the wilderness, Clyde Beatty defies the beasts of the jungle, and Victor Borga entertains with five minutes of musical laughs. Tuesday and Thursday, there are the Indian hero Straight Arrow riding to uphold justice, Sky King zooming to supersonic action, and Bobby Benson, the cowboy kid, in tales of western daring. Listen to Mutual's Hour for Fun with Mark Trail, Clyde Beatty, Victor Borga, Straight Arrow, Sky King, and Bobby Benson over most of these stations every weekday afternoon. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.